Awesome. So Jane, thank you so much for coming. Jane Healy is here this evening. She is the author of Good Night from Paris, which just came out in March, and several other novels of historical fiction, Jane, is that correct? Yes, yep. And um, also, Jane, you have a fab fabulous website. Um, <laughs> That's my husband. I can't take credit for it. <laughs> it's great. I'll put Jane um, Jane's mailing list in the chat, a link to her website, so you can sign up there. Um, but Jane is a local author and was kind enough to join us this evening and talk about her new book. Um, and I'm also hoping you'll talk to us a little bit about um, Historical Happy Hour, your podcast, a monthly webinar and podcast about other historical fiction authors and their latest novels. Absolutely. Um, has Have most people in the group read, read Good Night from Paris? That was a book club pick, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Our, right. If you want to just put in the chat if you've read it for folks who are um, off the screen, that would be great. Yes. Or, uh, oh, we've had a few people who've read it, and then we've had a few people who have not, Jane. Oh, okay. Um, I was just, uh, just out of curiosity, uh, you know, I have a presentation. I'm going to um, try to share my screen now, and um, no, there's no spoilers in the presentation. So, excuse me, there is somebody that has a hand up. Maybe oh, I. The person. Um, Rushika. Oh, thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Rushika, did you yeah, have, um, did you just want to say that you'd read the book or would you like to say something else? So I just figured I'd better, it's good to travel when I was driving. I think she was just confirming. Okay. okay. Um, are you, um, Brittany, are you going to mute everyone while I'm presenting? Is that? Yes, I can. That would be great. Just because the, the, the ambient noise, I get distracted very easily. So, and can I, can you see the screen? Okay, Brittany, everything looking good. My screen, that is. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, awesome. All right, so I'm going to dive in. Um, so, like I said, I am going to talk tonight about the history behind the story. Um, how I first learned about Drew Leighton Tartier, who the story is based on. This book is a departure from my other historical fiction novels in that the main character is, um, the protagonist is based on a real person in history, so it's biographical fiction. And uh, um, as I said, there will be no spoilers. Um, before I jump into the story of Drew Tartier, Drew Leighton Tartier, I want to share this story from 2020, which I think puts into context why this woman, why her story. This is Lauren Frame. He was a bomber pilot for the Royal Canadian Armed Forces in France during World War II. And he received the National Order of the Legion of Honor from France um, for his time as a bomber pilot. Um, this, was a, this was given to him in February, 2020. And this is a speech that they gave honoring Lorne. At the age of 20 and on his 13th mission, his plane was attacked by German night fighters. His plane was shot down on the edge of the Fontainebleau forest south of Paris. As he fought to control the descending plane, he ordered his crew to evacuate. He was the last person out of the plane. After walking all night, Mr. Frame found himself in the village of Barbizon. There he came into contact with an American woman by the name of Drew Cartier. Mrs. Tartier spent the war years assisting the French underground. As she spoke English, Mr. Frame was able to convince her that he was a member of the Allied forces and not a German soldier. Mrs. Tartier hid Mr. Frame in the back of her house where he was eventually joined by members of his crew. They stayed hidden for seven weeks until Barbizon was liberated in August, 1944. As benefits a true hero, Mr. Frame minimizes his contributions and sacrifices. To this day, he praises the women and men of the French underground, and in particular, Drew Tartier. So this is Lauren again. Lauren and I um, have a copy of Drew's autobiography that she wrote about her experiences during the war. Um, it, she wrote it in 1946. And um, I think that Lauren and I have two of the only copies still available in the world because it's out of print. I found mine on eBay by a, a seller in the UK and I paid way too many pounds for it, but I knew I had to have it. 
And the great thing about the autobiography is in the middle part of the autobiography, there's some black and white photos of Drew's time during the war. And one of them, and I have a better photo of this um, later in the, in the presentation, one of them is of Drew and Lorne um, after France was liberated, celebrating in the back of the courtyard of her villa in Barbizon. So a little bit about me before I dive in. Um, I, you may, not, may or may not know about my books. Um, I, 20 years ago, I left a career in high tech um, when my daughters were born. They're 19 and 16 now. And um, I was working as a freelance writer for many years and also kind of trying to work on fiction and the fringes of my life, I like to say. And I wrote an article about um, Saturday Evening Girl Pottery, which um, was made by this group of, uh, of Italian and Jewish immigrant women in Boston's North End at the turn of the 20th century. And that became my first novel, Saturday Evening Girls Club, which came out in 2017. Um, it took me about 10 years to write. It took me um, a couple more years to get it published. I had, I stopped counting at like 62 rejections or something the first time I tried to get it published in 2014, 2015. Um, but I finally got a cut, cut a break in 2017. Um, after that, I'd always wanted to write a World War II novel. My grandfather was in World War II, is a firefighter on the Navy ships off the coast of Africa and Europe. And I had read about this group of women called the Red Cross Clubmobile Girls who served coffee and donuts at the front lines of the war um, in World War II. And the more I dug into their stories, the more I thought this could be my World War II novel. I wanted to write a bigger story. Um, and so that became The Beantown Girls. It came out in 2019. And that book kind of broke me out. It was a number one Amazon bestseller. It was number seven on the Washington Post. Um, it was randomly on the Seth Meyers late night show. Um, I'm not sure how that happened. Um, so after that, I um, wanted to write another novel. And I had heard about these women of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which was the precursor of the CIA in World War II, essentially America's first um, female spies. And that became The Secret Stealers. In, and that came out in 2021. Not the best time for a novel to come out, I'll be honest. It was better than 2020, but it wasn't great. Um, but you know, it did well enough. Um, it was uh, Amazon First Reads Editor's Choice. It was a historical novel society editor's choice and Cosmo uh, magazine voted it best, one of the best historical fiction novels of 2021. So my publishers were happy enough um, for me to write another story. Um, and so I was, I always keep kind of a running file of novels, I mean, of, of novel ideas. And, um, you know, I wasn't really intending to write another World War II story. If you, um, you know, if you read any historical fiction, you know that the World War II subgenre is very crowded. But when I was researching The Secret Stealers, I came across this story that I couldn't let go of. And the story was um, after Pearl Harbor, a few months after Pearl Harbor, the Germans rounded up several hundred American women who were living, still living in France as expatriates um, in Paris and beyond and the surrounding villages. And they arrested them. And the first place they imprisoned them was a zoo outside Paris. Um, and they kept them in the zoo for a couple of days. And then from the zoo, they transported them to an internment camp um, in the mountains of France in a, in a resort spa town called Vittel. It was several hotels surrounded by bar barbed wire. And there were several hundred American and British women who were imprisoned there. Um, I read about that story in a couple different sources when I was reading The Secret Sailors, and I was like, I, could, I couldn't let it go. It was so bizarre. It was stranger than fiction. It had these elements of comedy and tragedy when I was reading about the women's accounts. And one of the women in the prison, in both the prison at the zoo and the prison in Vittel, was this American actress, Drew Layton. And so... Um, the more I dug into Drew's life, the more I was fascinated by it, and I decided to pitch it to my editors, despite the fact that the World War II market is crowded, because it was it was a different angle on the war, and her story was so fascinating. Um, so they said, go ahead, and, uh, and that's when I started the deep dive into the research on Drew Leighton Tartier. So who was she? She was born um, Dorothy Elizabeth Blackman in 1903 in Kenosha, Wisconsin. She lived in Mexico with her family for a time. 
She was edu educated at a boarding school in Switzerland. Um, so they were a pretty well-to-do family. At 19 years old, she married um, her first husband and he was 34 years old and they had a son and um, it was kind of, it was a doomed marriage from the start really. So they were not married very long at all. And she had always dreamed of going to Hollywood. So she actually left her husband and son to pursue an acting career in Hollywood. So this is one of the photos from her Hollywood days. She, um, you know, in the beginning of her career in Hollywood, she had some smaller roles in these movies that are listed over here. Um, Change of Heart, Valley of Wanted Men. But um, she started to get success fairly quickly. This is another still, I believe this is from one of the Charlie Chan movies. She did a, some modeling, like a lot of Hollywood actresses. She did mo modeling on the side. Um, she was compared to Greta Garbo as like the next Greta Garbo. Um, this is a, this photo over here, this is an advertisement for eye cream. Drew Layton, a beauty whose eyes are alive, fresh and sparkling and kept that way by proper care, which is like such a 30s type of advertisement. Um, this is an, a small little article in a Hollywood newspaper that I thought kind of showed her kind of feistiness and strong personality. She was on a movie set at Fox Studios, and um, she basically told her director, I'm taking the day off to take my two hairdressers out to lunch and to have our fortunes told, and I'm sure they weren't thrilled about it, um, but she went anyway. She was a huge animal lover. Um, I had, um, I was lucky enough to get a hold of her scrapbooks at, at, from her Hollywood days. And um, she, w this was her Great Dane um, that lived with her in California. And when I tell you there was more pictures of this Great Dane in the scrapbooks than there were any people. Um, but the, she'd take the Dr Great Dane on movie sets and he would terrorize other people on movie sets. And to the point that she took out $20,000 bite insurance after he got tough with Charlie Chan. This is some little cartoon that someone did. So the Charlie Chan movies really started to put her on the map. Um, you might recognize her face from those. They're still on TV. They're still on YouTube. Um, and th this was when her star was really on the rise. She was in several of them as the kind of the bl blonde sidekick. Um, these are a few. I think she, there was one other one besides Charlie, these three. She was starting, you know, she made it to the, on the movie poster. This is her here, Charlie Chan in London. And this is a little clip. Mr. Chan, have you seen Lake? Yes. What did he say? What did you find out? Nothing. He is dead. What? That's it of the clip. My husband <laughs> did that one. We th thought that was just enough. And it was, it was really great as a writer to, um, to have, you know, be able to look at this actress and watch some of these just to get her physicality and the tone of her voice and things like that. That was really helpful. Um, so her star's on the rise and she's doing incredibly well in Hollywood. She takes a break from Hollywood to perform on Broadway and um, she meets Jacques Tartier, who is a French actor who was trying to make it as an actor. Um, and he's, in, he's on performing on a small bit on Broadway at the time. Um, it's a whirlwind romance, and um, so she, after she performs on Broadway, she reunites with him in London and performs in the West End of London, and then by 38, they were married, and she moves to Paris with him um, right before the war. This is one of the only pictures of them that I've been able to find. This was from a French newspaper of Jacques and Drew. So, um, Jacques had lung issues, so he could not enlist in the French army. So he goes, um, but he wanted to serve his country. He desperately wanted to serve his country. So he gets a position as a translator for the British army. And so he goes off to war with the British. And Drew had multiple chances to leave France. Um, she was friends with the ambassador in Paris. Um, she had co many connections. She, her family wanted her to go, go back to America and wait out the war. Jacques wanted her to go out back and wait out the war. And she refused because she wanted to be close to where he was. And she had a network of friends, expatriates and Parisians that um, she was close with. And she was very close with her housekeeper, Nadine, as well. Um, she becomes like a sister. So, so she stays. 
This is the real Nadine for those of you who have read the book. So um, not a lot of jobs for American actresses in France, um, but she's approached by the French Ministry of Information because they're looking for an American personality to become a radio broadcaster for their radio station, Radio Mondial, Paris Mondial, um, and broadcast at night um, cultural programming and um, news programming to an American audience. And so um, she essentially becomes the first voice of America. And in addition to the cultural programming, she would do like day in the life and you know, so all sorts of programming like that. But she also did um, some hard hitting political reporting and she pulled in journalists who were reporting about, about what was happening on the continent of Europe to try to convince an American audience that, that what was happening in Europe was going to affect America as well. If you remember, um, America was very isolationist at the time. This was post-World War I. They were war weary. And there were figures like Charles Lindbergh who were um, quite anti-Semitic and advocating for, he, he was a rising political star advocating for no involvement in another world war. Um, so she starts broadcasting and she gets so good at her jobs that her job that the Germans take notice and they start announcing on Berlin radio that she will be executed as soon as France is occupied. And they they didn't just announce this once, they announced this many times on Berlin radio. And um, she kept broadcasting until of course, um, Paris falls in June of 1940. And she flees Paris along with several thousand other people. She flees with the Radio Mondiale team. And um, uh, she goes to Vichy to, to try to report on what is going on there for as long as she can. Um, and eventually she relocates, she realizes that she needs to lie low and relocates to the village of Barbizon, which is about an hour and a half southwest of Paris. Um, she leases an apartment there. Now she's terrified, of course, because she's afraid they're gonna make the connection between Drew Layton and Drew Layton Tartier. So she drops Layton, she stops using Drew Layton and goes by Tartier from now on. So just to give you some political context and some, some context of what was actually happening at that time, Ger France is split in two. Um, the North, three fifths of the mainland of France is taken over by the Germans including, of course, all the coastline. Um, and then there was a so-called free zone in the south, which is governed by a French government in Vichy, France. Um, but this was really, I mean, the Vichy French government was um, collaborating with the Germans almost from the start. And then by 1942, Germany had occupied all of France. So on June 13th, 1940, Parisians go to bed and they wake into the sound of German accented voice saying curfew is imposed and Germans had occupied the city by that evening. These, these are pretty famous photos. Hitler had only visited Paris maybe like one time during the war. So these next photos are life during the occupation um, in Paris, and they're considered somewhat controversial because the um, Germans use them as propaganda, as if to say, you know, look at all these Parisians going about their daily life with German soldiers around, everything is fine. But of course, then you look at the flags and um, nothing was fine. And up just beneath the surface, um, things started to deteriorate fast, particularly if you were Jewish. Um, these German um, signs went up all over the city. Um, and one of the small acts of resistance by teenagers was to kind of reverse and push the signs around so that the German soldiers would get lost. There was no gas for Parisians. So um, they had to rely on these types of bicycle contraptions and horse and buggy um, because the Germans had all the petrol, all the gas. So Drew um, knew, knew of Barbizon, the small art, artist village, um, an hour and a half southwest of Paris it, because of Jacques' family. So she leases a villa on the main street in Barbizon. This is a picture of the villa. Randomly, you can still rent it um, for $107 a night on Airbnb. Um, it's It looks small, but it's deceiving because it's just surrounded by stone walls. And in the back, there is a courtyard. And then behind the courtyard, there's two very small cottages. And so Nadine and Drew start 
a vegetable garden in the courtyard, and then they get chickens and ducks and other animals um, to help feed their friends in Paris because food is getting scarcer and scarcer by the day. Um, on a random side note, um, my husband lived in Paris for a time, and we have some, you know, random antique prints he's picked up over the years at different antique shops and stuff. And um, when I looked at this house, I this villa, it looked familiar to me, but I kind of brushed it off. And then I realized that um, we have a print in our hallway going up to the second floor that is of of um, Villa Squirrel. The, the house that is in this that that drew least in Barbizon. Um, I never even noticed that um, it says Barbizon down here. And um, so that was a pretty wild coincidence. So this is Drew with one of her neighbors in Barbizon. I call this period of her life during the war kind of the calm before the storm. She, um, her boss from her Radio Mondial day, Jean comes out and stays um, in Barbizon with her too, to lie low, but also to start building resistance connections and working with the resistance in France. Um, she is, and Nadine are becoming farmers, They and Jean convinces them to lease this farmhouse um, near the Fontainebleau Forest, which is uh, outside of the village of Barbizon. So they, they grow vegetables and have more animals while Jean conducts resistance activities from the farm. And this is the first time that Drew gets involved um, with the French resistance. And then, of course, um, the story I mentioned at the beginning happens. So in you know, Pearl Harbor, um, several hundred American women are arrested in September of 42, post Pearl Harbor. Um, and the Germans say, I, I, I say that they're doing this under the pretense of, well, um, Americans are arresting all these German women in America, which was a complete lie. So um, they are imprisoned in the zoo outside Paris. The, the zoo is empty of animals. That's a question I get. There were no animals. There was a lot of animal smells, um, but they were imprisoned in the monkey house in the zoo, um, several hundred American women, and their friends and family have to pay five francs to get into the zoo and so that they can yell at them over the fence about like, what do you need? What can we bring? And then a couple of days after they're imprisoned in the zoo, um, these women are taken to this Vittel prison camp. And they're, that is um, like, a, it's, uh, it's in the mountains of France. There are already several hundred British women there that welcome them. And um, at, from the moment Drew gets there, she decides she's gonna figure out a way to escape, a way to get out. So she, convinces, I won't go into too much detail, but she basically convinces a doctor to help her um, fake being incredibly ill. He prescribes her medicine that makes her seem very, very ill, and she takes it to the extreme in both her acting and her physical health to the point that she almost dies. Um, but the, the Germans buy the fact that they think she's dying of cancer, and so um, they eventually um, release her thinking that she's dying. So they release her, this, and this is her real release papers from the Germans, and um, this is a translation. So she's freed, you know, she was imprisoned in September, and she is freed in Dece early December. Um, the interesting thing about these papers are, um, you know, she is going to be living in Barbizon. She has to report into the Gestapo headquarters in Paris, but this the certificate also entitles her to travel back and forth from Paris to Barbizon freely whenever she wants. And this was um, just something that nobody had. It, no, no expatriates had this, no French people had this. So it was like, a, if you're working for the French resistance, this is essentially the golden ticket um, to go back, be able to freely travel um, was unheard of. So she escapes back to Barbizon. She's very, very sick because um, she almost kills herself escaping by taking all these all this medicine. Um, she is still incredibly paranoid because they still have not made the connection between Drew Layton on the radio and Drew Tartier, married to Jacques Tartier, the Frenchman. Um, she's approached immediately by the resistance to help again, and she refuses the call because she's so ill and is trying to recover. But at the same time during the war, Allied planes, British, American, and Canadian planes start crashing all over the countryside. And um, so 
villagers start coming to Drew at all hours of the night, knocking on her door saying, I have an American in my apple tree and he's injured and he does not speak French. Can you help me? Or, you know, I have a Canadian in my haystack and I don't know what to do. And I, he doesn't understand me. And so, and these, you know, these are young, young guys. And of course, Drew feels compelled um, to help and get, starts getting involved with rescuing these allied flyers that are dropping out of the sky all over the countryside. So she starts working with this underground network that is, is rescuing allied flyers and getting them out of the country, um, not only in the surrounding villages outside of Paris, but um, also within Paris, there, there was already a network of doctors who had formed, um, had, had formed a network uh, and and were hiding aviators all over the city of Paris in these small apartments with these very generous families. Um, so she's working as a translator. She's helping supply food and clothing and, and documents for these aviators hiding in Paris and beyond. And, um, and she directly aids the escape of many British and American and Canadian flyers. And then at the end of the war, um, when it was clear that um, that France was going to be liberated, a lot of these flyers, you know, the underground network shut down, and a lot of these flyers um, had to be hidden for several weeks, and so Drew takes it upon herself to hide five of them in her villa in Barbizon in, in the village um, at the end of the war. So France is liberated in um, 1944, August 1944, and the British um, and, and, and the village has a party to celebrate the end of the war and thank, and thank these allied flyers, as well as Drew and Nadine. Uh, and by the end of the war, Drew had overseen the escape of at least 32 American, British, and Canadian flyers and assisted in helping over 100 other allied flyers escape France via the underground network. And this is the picture that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, um, this is Drew and Lauren Frame. If you read the book, you'll know there's a Lauren in the book named, you know, in honor of the real Lauren, Lauren Frame. Um, this is um, Lieutenant Charles Whipple and Bill Watson, uh, and they were all staying with Drew at the end of the war. So then um, the war ends and she writes this autobiography and she tours the country. Um, look, you know, uh, she she goes back to America and starts touring the country, ex sharing her experiences of of what happened um, while she and and you remember too, like there was very little communication. So actually, her family and friends in America didn't know she if she was alive or dead. And then she writes this autobiography, re reunites with her family, talks about her experiences all over the um the U.S. and reunites with some of the flyers, which was amazing too. So this is at the Algonquin Hotel. In New York City, and um, she again reunites with Lauren Frame and some of the other flyers that she helped rescue, which is amazing. This is another picture of her reuniting with some of her um, some of the aviators she helped escape. So you know, I, I think that just to sum up why this story. This is, a, you know, she got, she received a lot of awards and accolades after the war. She wrote this book. She traveled America, shared her experiences. Um, and then, you know, like a lot of stories in history, a lot of stories of women, um, her stories kind of been forgotten. I, you know, I, when I when I said I heard of her, I, I saw there was like maybe a paragraph or a couple sentences in a couple of different books I read while I was doing my research for The Secret Stealers. And that's what compelled me to write her story and share it. And um, it was interesting because she also connected with some other expatriates in, um, in France, in Paris during the war at, who were also extraordinary women in history. And, and one of them was Dorothy Thompson, who I feel like I should know more about. Um, I wish I had known more about her before this. I wrote this book. She was this iconic American journalist she was an international American journalist when there were very few female international journalists in the world. She lived in Germany and Berlin covering um, Germany in the 1930s and was one of the only um, international journalists to interview Hitler. And when you read her reading, you know, her writings from the 30s, 
she predicted everything. She saw it all. She met and interviewed this man. And, um, you know, it was like she had a crystal ball as to what was going to happen in Europe and how the American involvement was inevitable. Um, so she was really a force of nature. Um, this is another, I, I added this slide because I think this kind of shows how, what a strong and amazing woman uh, Dorothy Thompson was. So this is in February 1939 um, at a German-American Bund rally in Madison Square Garden in New York City. There was 20,000 pro-Nazi Americans at this rally. And she was supposed to be going to an award ceremony nearby for her. She was being honored at this award ceremony. And, um, and she said, you know, I have to go turn the car around, goes to this rally, gets herself seated at the front with all the press um, and starts heckling every single speaker. And if you could, you look at some of the, the, the looks on these men, some of the men behind her, um, she, they, she had to be escorted out because they were going to kill her. Um, you know, people were threatening to kill her. So she, she was really, uh, you know, she, she was incredibly, um, you know, she predicted that everything that was coming and, and, and not unafraid to speak about it. This is another um, who was who was also on Drew's radio shows. Another um, amazing American woman, Josephine Baker. She was she was on the radio on Drew's radio shows a couple of times. Um, she fled America because uh, she had a kind of a, a difficult life in America as an African American wo woman, and um, she moved to Paris for more accept acceptance and. Um, the French people embraced her and she is still adored to this day. Um, she was an actress, a singer, a dancer. She's one of the most revered entertainers in France. And she also, I don't go into this in the story, but she also aided the resistance by smuggling allied intelligence in her sheet music because she was such a big entertainer. She, she could, was free to move about different countries very easily. And so she aided the resistance in that way. So she was, she was also extraordinary. Another friend of Drew's who was also imprisoned at the zoo um, was Sylvia Beach. She was the owner of the iconic bookstore in Paris, Shakespeare and Company. Also the first publisher of James Joyce's Ulysses. She was a dear friend of Ernest Hemingway and um, she was imprisoned with Drew in the zoo and also at the Mattel camp in the mountains. Um, and she didn't get out right away. She actually um, didn't get out till um, the spring, I think, I believe. Um, and she, you know, the, the hotels that they were imprisoned in were not heated. So she became quite sick and quite depressed, but she finally did get out. And she also held through um, with the allied flyers that were hiding all around Paris. She supplied with them with books and cards and tried to entertain them because they were stuck in these tiny apartments, you know, in one room for hours and hours. So. Um, so she was involved in that as well. Um, a little bit about cover designs because people kind of like the inside baseball about um, book covers. So this book, I had some very specific ideas about what I wanted on the cover and I had a Pinterest page and I shared all my ideas with my publisher and my editors. And I just said, I just don't want a big fat Eiffel Tower on the cover. Like, can we please like, there's so many Eiffel Tower books. I just don't want a big Eiffel Tower on the cover. And um, and of course, their first round of covers they sent me are big fat Eiffel Towers. <laughs> and um, so my my editor loved these. I did not like them. I felt like there's just, but apparently, according to the sales and marketing departments, Eiffel Towers sell books. Um, but that we went back to the drawing board and came back with these three. Um, this one has a radio on it. Um, can't even really tell us radio. And then this one I really liked, but it was looked very similar to another one that's out there. And then I love um, I loved this one from the start. And we tweaked it. And um, they actually, you know, the final version of they added a little Eiffel Tower in the corner of the cover, just so everyone's happy now. So um, this is my little author PSA. And then I'd love to take questions. I'll stop my screen sharing. Um, you know. My editors always say you can do all the social media, you can do all the marketing in the world, but word of mouth is the best marketing. If you like a book, tell your friends, tell your libraries, tell your indie bookstores, tell your book clubs. Um, so any book, not just my books. Um, I have a mailing list. I only send out things when I have things going on 
um, you know, webinars, in-person events, all kinds of stuff like that. I do a monthly historical happy hour that, um, live webinar that I also convert to a YouTube um, recording and a podcast. The next one coming up is May 17th. We've got to get that on the website like today, and um, I'll be sending out the invitation for it this week. The author is a new author, Julie Garrison, and she um, wrote this book called Daughters of Nantucket about a group of women in Nantucket uh, around the time of the Great Fire in the 1800s. And I've started reading, it's really good. My last one was with um, Alka Joshi, who wrote The Henna Artist. Um, I That recording will be up as a podcast and as on YouTube um, in the next week. And, um, and yeah, and consider writing online reviews. Those are also helpful as well. So thank you um, for listening. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'd love to take any questions. Thank you. Is everybody back live? Yes, everybody is back and should be able to hear us as well. Jane, I'll keep you pinned because we can still see everyone else in the top. <laughs> so why do you think women get forgotten for their deeds? <laughs> yeah, why, so why do I think? I think that's an excellent question. I will tell you, I think now we're in a really good time where there's like lots of great historical fiction about um, lesser known women's stories. I think there's lots of uh, nonfiction about lesser known women's stories, but I think, um, you know, um, Tara Westover, I heard her speak one time, she wrote that um, memoir, Educated, and she's a historian. And she said, you know, for a long time, um, historians were men and historians are human and they recorded for history what they deemed was most important. And oftentimes that was not women's stories. So I think that that is part of it. And I think that, like I said, that has changed quite a bit um, in the last, you know, century. But I think for a long time, um, men's stories were con just considered more important because men were the ones recording them. Yeah, I, I've read a lot of books in the last five or 10 years on World War II and women. Yes. The trend, is, the trend is not just World War II, it's women and what they did during World War II. And they, they were quieter jobs. They were more hidden jobs than the men out there shooting, shooting them up. Yeah, um, yeah. But doing, I, one, I can't remember the names of anything, but one I read was all about saving all the art from the Louvre and moving it all over Paris and so on, and that, uh, all over France and other places. And that was so impressive to read how they got that accomplished. Um, in your book, I was a little bit surprised in my mind at how easily in a funny way she was able drew was able to move all over the place and bring food to people and all the other books i've read you know it's like people are hiding and being afraid yeah. of the germans and she managed to manipulate that german guy the dutch guy i guess he was dutch um in the village um who kept harassing her but somehow never really did anything that was harmful or I just, every time he showed up, I thought, oh, this is it now. He's going to arrest her or do something. Um, I, can you speak to that a little bit? It seemed like there was a, she had quite a bit of freedom to do the things that she was doing. Yeah, and she was pretty bold about it too. But yeah, she had quite a bit of freedom because um, she had that pass after Pearl Harbor. She got that pass and and that let her go, you know, and they, they gave her that pass because quite frankly, they thought she was going to die. Like they thought she wasn't going to be around very long. And so, um, so they gave her that pass. And so she used that to her advantage to go back and forth between Paris and, and Barbizon many times, uh, including disguising some of the allied flyers that were in Barbizon to get them into Paris and get them out of the country. Like she disguised them in like peasant clothes and do whatever she could. And, and yeah, she was very bold about it though. Yeah, she really- was there really a doctor at the head of that whole thing who cooked up the idea and gave her that document that said that she had cancer or was yeah. that something that you fabricate? No, certainly. no, no, that was all true. And that's, um, so in my author's notes in the back of the book, I, my, uh, my research notes are pretty detailed because this was a real woman in history. And I, I wanted to kind of explain what, what was fact and what was fiction, but that, 
yeah, they, her and this doctor um, cooked up this whole scheme to for her to take these meds and and make her look like she was getting which she was very ill but she took it um even further than than he wanted her to um and and got herself very very sick Jane um you said that Barbizon is about an hour and a half uh outside Paris yeah southwest by train yeah by train and how, how how about when you're riding a bicycle with a basket full of vegetables? Oh, I know. Well, she took the train to part Paris often. That she didn't bike to Paris, um, but she oh. yeah she she but you know the but going back and forth between the farms and the villages, she would bike. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, it looks like there's another um, question in the chat. Are there any rules when you're writing historical fiction? about individuals who lived, what you can add to the story that was never written down before. <clears throat> yeah, so this was um, by far the hardest of the four books um, because of that, because she was a real person of history. This is biographical fiction. I felt like there was certain parameters that I really needed to adhere to. I couldn't, you know, to honor her story and to honor the fact that she was a real person in history. I was really um, uh, careful of that. So, and that's why my notes at the end of the book, my research notes are so detailed because when I did take leaps, you know, because at the end of the day, this is based on a real person, but it's a novel. It has to have a beginning and middle and end. It has to hopefully be compelling. Um, and so I had to make some leaps and some changes. And so I, my notes at the end kind of detail, here's where I took leaps, here's, here's who is fictionalized, Here's this character who is a composite of a few different people that she knew, um, things like that. Um, Carol, did you get to ask your question? You had your hand raised. Uh, yeah, that I, I was the one who put the question in the chat about when you're writing historical fiction about someone who actually lived, what limits or what things do you have to take into account, you know, when you're trying to, t to stay true to the story, but yet at some points you add things. And um, and Jane, thank you. You answered the question very carefully and thoughtfully. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thanks for asking. Um, is it Rushika? Yes. Hi. So um, I am wondering like what was the, because uh, like the story stopped, you decided to end the novel um, right when everything's kind of like, yeah, this is a good point. So I'm just curious why you chose that point because I was really interested to know what happened with Nadine and Lauren and yeah, yeah, I get that question a lot. Um, I I think like and that's hard. Endings are hard. Um, I wanted to end it on an on a bittersweet up note. I wanted to end it. I like to end my stories on an up note, like a positive note. Um, but of course, this was bittersweet because this is a real person and this was her real life. Um, and I pulled in the romance, um, which is unconfirmed between Nadine and one of the aviators that was living with that. That was a, a fix. That's one of the places I took a leap. Um, but yeah, so I, I that's I ended it because I thought like, OK, so there's, you know, Paris is uh, France is free. Um, you know, there's some peace in the world again. The, uh, the village is celebrating. Um, Nadine's in love, um, you know, and I, I, it just felt like the right, the right time to end it after all that she had been through. Yeah. But also, like I was like when I was trying to research more about Druletten after the war uh, got over. I mean, um, there wasn't actually. I mean, I personally couldn't find much. I'm very glad that you have this presentation because it gave me some glimpses of it but there wasn't much on the wikipedia and there was like I, probably i didn't search enough but how was her life after the fact like i know she did some tours but she was quickly forgotten but how was did she ever get remarried was did she have more kids like i'm just curious yeah. about her no excellent and that, this is one of the questions i get a lot and i know that this will be a little bit of a spoiler but that's okay it's a book club so um so she remarried after she, so she toured the US, she wrote a book, she toured the US, she reunited with her family. Um, she had this, she reunited with her son um, 
from her first marriage, but it was in a strange relationship for a while. And I'll tell you, I also get the question, why didn't you include the son? And I really, yes. yeah, yeah. I really didn't have, I had originally included the son in the first draft of my manuscript, but I didn't have a lot of data on him. I couldn't find anything about him. And so I didn't feel comfortable talking about this real son who might still be alive um, and including him in the book when I didn't really know their relationship or what happened. He's not really mentioned much in her autobiography, sadly. And so um, so she goes back, she reunites, at, but she's in the articles, in the newspaper articles that, that are written about her, she says, France is my home now, Paris is my home now. And she moved back to Paris. Um, she remarried. Um, his name was Jeffrey Parsons Jr. He was the head of the Herald International Tribune in Paris. And um, she lives there until um, she lived there until she was in her 70s, I want to say. And then she moved back to California um, to be close with her family uh, as she got older and um, and lived to about 94 and um, in, and passed away in California about 20 years ago. Um, so uh, and when I talk about this, so she only had the one son. Um, she did finally kind of mend her, her relationship with him. The reason I had her scrapbooks is because when I was finishing the draft, I was like, you know, if someone's writing a book about my grandmother, I would want to know that this was coming. And so I tracked down the, um, the son and daughter of her son from the first marriage. His name was Ellis. I found Ellis's son and daughter, Drew's grandson and granddaughter through Ancestry.com. And I reached out to them. And thankfully, um, they were very supportive of the project. Um, they filled in some blanks for me. And they and Tracy, the granddaughter, generously mailed me Drew's scrapbooks. Um, to, and so I scanned them all and sent them back to her. But a lot of the pictures you see in the presentation are from Drew's um, personal scrapbooks. Oh. No. Amazing. Thank Amazing. you. Thank you. Jane, um, Josephine Baker seems seems to be pretty well known. Um, aside from the fact that she got the cross to gear or whatever from she was actually recognized by the French. Yes. And given a military funeral. Yes. Um, but what about all these other women who faded into the woodwork? You know, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, jo uh, Dorothy Thompson is one that I was like, just gobsmacked by like she at a time in, in America, she had a syndicated radio show all over the country, and a newspaper column that was in like every single newspaper. She was also married to Sinclair Lewis, the playwright, she had like a very um, kind of this amazing life. And, um, and I was really fascinated and kind of surprised that there hasn't been more about her. I mean, I read some books about her. I did a bunch of research about her, but particularly the way that she kind of called everything that was happening in, you know, and that would happen in, in the war in Europe and beyond and, and America's inevitable involvement. She was just unbelievable. I mean, I, and some of the, some of the quotes in the book, some of the, there's a passage in the book based on one of her columns. Um, yeah, I was just in awe of her. Um, there was a question. Oh, I'm so sorry. Was there somebody no, else? I, Rashika, you asked, am I going to write a book on yes. Doris Thompson? <laughs> I know, I've thought about it. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure, but um, but uh, she's certainly like, there's so much there. She was, yeah, she she was amazing. Amazing. And like her personal life, she had like affairs with men, affairs with women. Like she was all like, she's got a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. There was a um, PBS show on masterpiece a couple of years ago about the beginnings of world war ii that had a woman um news person in it who was really the one who was she was living in germany she was sending back all kinds of news predicting what was going to happen with the germans it was before the war started and i'm just wondering if she might have been modeled a little bit after um dorothy thompson I'm, I'm, I don't know whether it's going to have more episodes or not. You never know what's coming with, with Masterpiece, but yeah. um, I'm going to go back and try to find it and just for the heck of it, watch her again. She was a very strong character. I think I can't remember. She was played by the woman. Oh, she had a sitcom on TV for a long time. Anyway, I'm no good with names anymore. I've run out of 
years to remember anybody's name. Was it Miranda Hart? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, she was very much modeled after that personality. Oh, I'll bet. Yeah, I'll have to look that up too. Yeah, I'm sure it was modeled. Hold on fire or something. Was yes, I read that. I watched that. That was, yeah, I, I, I don't remember yeah. the journalist though. I have to look that up again. Yeah. yeah. That was good though. Um, oh, someone has their hand. Uh, Andre yeah. and Lillian Shore. Do you have a question? Yeah, I do. How come uh, that uh, Dorothy Thompson, who travels so much and uh, he she wrote a lot uh, against the Germans. She didn't have any problem uh, of being pursued or arrested. Um, actually, she was um as kicked out of Germany after her uh, after a time. Um, she was kicked out of Germany by Hitler, so she was not allowed to go back to the country ever again. After um after she she actually wrote a book about. Um, her interview with him, and of course, her writings were very um, anti-Nazi. So, yeah, she was kicked out of out of the country of Germany. Um, I want, I'm not sure exactly what year it was. I think it was around 36, 37. I think it was. The, yeah, I think it was just modeled maybe after her. Uh, were there any more questions for Jane? We are coming right up upon the. I have. Part. I have one. Maybe oh, great. Jane, do you have any idea why there's suddenly this um, great number of books about German or about World War II, spy networks and and um, the? Yeah, I do. I have a couple of theories. Um, I don't know if they're the right ones, but um, one of them is. Um, that we're losing that population now, right? Like my grandfather passed away several years ago. There's not many um, members of that generation who, who lived through the war left. Um, I think that's one of the reasons. I also think that, um, you know, it is a war that um, where there was, a, it was very black and white who was on the wrong side and who was on the right side in that war. And, um, and so I think there is, um, I think that's another reason why there's that kind of there's a nostalgia because we're losing that generation, and also there's a there's a very clear um, good and there's good guys and bad guys in that war, and it's very clear who is who. Hmm. I I I keep thinking that maybe it's because one of the it, it's actually shining a mirror on what's going on these days. Oh yeah, I mean that well that too. There's definitely um, some parallels when I was writing the scenes of the Belgians um, streaming into Paris, the Belgian refugees. I, um, it was right around the time that um, Ukrainian refugees were streaming into Poland and I could not help but, um, you know, it was very, I got a little emotional um, reading that, those stories of the Belgian refugees and then seeing what was happening in the Ukraine. Um, and in fact, I was, I, I did a podcast interview with a woman, um, she's a podcast, author podcast, and she said that, she was quite emotional reading that part in the book because um, her mother was a child and was a, a refugee from Belgium in Paris um, during the war. She was a small child and, um, and her brother was an infant. And so she, when she read about the children of um, the Belgian children in Paris, she got pretty emotional about that. But yeah, there's definitely some parallels to um, some of the things going on in the world today politically and, and otherwise. Were there any other questions for Jane before we wrapped up? I do have one, Jane, if you, if yeah. you don't mind. I was um, looking at the discussion questions, which I um, were on your website. And I'm just curious, do you get to write them or is that something that your publisher or does? <laughs> That's all me. I wish my publisher did. I really struggle with those questions. I, I just put them up there. I'm so glad you found them because I've been asked by a few book clubs this in the past few weeks and I'm like, oh, I got to write some. So I just put them up there. But yeah, that is, yeah, I'm a one woman team with all this stuff, except for my husband. He helps me with my tech stuff. But yeah, um, it's all, it's just me. <laughs> oh. Wonderful. They're great questions. Oh, good. I'm um, glad you think so. Yes. Um, oh, and yes, Chica agrees that they're very helpful in book club discussions. 
Um, we've also had a bunch of thank yous for you um, in the chat, Jane. Thank you so much for coming to our book group. We loved having you. We have tons of World War II fans in the audience. So <laughs> it was great yeah. to talk to you and learn more about Drew Leon. Yes, and thank you for your flexibility in pivoting to Zoom. I have, um, this is one of four events I have this week and I'm moving my daughter back from college and it's oh. a busy week. So I'm glad this worked out. Thank you so much. Yes, we hope you'll come back soon with your your next yeah, book. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, get, I'm working on it. We'll see. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Have a good night, everyone. Night. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, Thank everyone, you. for coming. Thank you.